Welcome to the fifth session in the ICU curriculum. In this session, we will cover septic shock. Our objectives for the session include to define sepsis and septic shock according to sepsis three definitions, describe the pathophysiologic abnormalities and clinical manifestations of septic shock, and to describe the treatment principles for a patient in septic shock, including appropriate antibiotics, fluid resuscitation, and vasopressors. As a reminder, in our prior session on shock, we introduced the shock and awe physical exam-based approach for going through the shock differential at the bedside for an undifferentiated patient. In today's session, we will be talking about the first part of this approach. Let's start with a case. The patient is a 65-year-old woman with diabetes presenting with a three-day history of dysuria and right flank pain. This morning, she became lightheaded, dizzy, and developed shaking chills. In the ER, she is febrile to 39.5, hypotensive to 70 over 40, and tachycardic to 140. On exam, she is pale, lethargic, and has suprapubic and right-sided CVA tenderness. After approximately 2 liters of IV fluid, her blood pressure remains 75 over 40. Labs return, and she has a white blood cell count of 17, creatinine of 2.5, and lactate of 6. She is admitted to the ICU for further management. It appears the patient is septic, likely from pyelonephritis and perhaps gram-negative bacteremia given her rigors. But is she in septic shock? And if so, how are we going to treat her when she arrives to the ICU? Sepsis is a time-sensitive medical emergency in the same way that STEMIs and CVAs are emergencies. Therefore, it is important that every doctor be able to recognize sepsis and septic shock and initiate evaluation and management promptly. In order to recognize sepsis and septic shock, we first need to be able to define both terms clinically. To define septic shock, you first need to be able to recognize and define sepsis. The definition for sepsis has evolved over the years. We are currently using the sepsis-3 task force definition from 2016, which defines sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. What does sepsis look like clinically? From 1991 to 2016, sepsis was defined as two out of four SERS criteria plus a suspected site of infection. As a review, the SERS criteria include temperature greater than 38 or less than 36 degrees Celsius, heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute, and white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000 or greater than 10% bands. The problem with SIRS is that it is not specific enough for recognizing sepsis, as a number of common inpatient medical problems can cause at least two of the aforementioned abnormalities. What else can we use then to identify the sickest patients with sepsis? The answer, QSOFA. QSOFA stands for Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment. It was created to identify patients with suspected infection likely to have sepsis or patients with sepsis at high risk of deterioration or poor outcome outside of the ICU, for example, patients on the floor or in the emergency room. QSOFA is composed of three variables, systolic hypotension less than 100 mm of mercury, respiratory rate greater than 22 breaths per minute, and altered mental status. As discussed in previous sessions, tachypnea and respiratory alkalosis are often the body's compensatory response to the worsening metabolic acidosis in sepsis or septic shock. One point is given for each variable present. Scores greater than or equal to 2 are predictive of worsened outcomes and increased in-hospital mortality. So, in a patient with either a known or suspected infection, two out of three QSOFA variables should prompt consideration of sepsis and or escalation of care to the ICU. Note, the term severe sepsis has largely fallen out of favor. Moving on to septic shock, sepsis-3 defines septic shock as a subset of sepsis in which underlying circulatory and cellular metabolism abnormalities are profound enough to substantially increase mortality. Clinically, septic shock is defined as sepsis plus vasopressors needed to maintain a MAP greater than or equal to 65 and a serum lactate greater than 2 despite adequate fluid resuscitation, here defined as 30 cc per kilogram of body weight. Basically, septic shock is sepsis plus hypotension after appropriate fluid resuscitation. Note, from the sepsis-3 guidelines, meeting all of these criteria is associated with greater than 40% hospital mortality. So, we have defined sepsis and septic shock. Next, let's describe the pathophysiologic abnormalities and clinical manifestations of septic shock. At its most basic, sepsis represents the body's immune response to infection. An infection triggers a cascade of inflammatory and immune responses that can potentially lead to multi-organ dysfunction and death. What types of infections cause sepsis? Prior to the 1980s, gram-negative infections predominated. In a gram-negative infection, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, of the bacterial cell wall triggers the inflammatory response. Since the 1980s, gram-positive infections have been the most common cause of sepsis. Gram-positive infections, namely Staph aureus and Streptopiogenes, trigger inflammation via exotoxin. 
Sepsis is most commonly caused by infections of the respiratory system, and then by infections of the GI and GU systems. Next, what are the clinical manifestations of septic shock? As discussed in the shock session, the equation mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance defines much of the physiology encountered within the ICU. In shock, the mean arterial pressure decreases. Therefore, there are two ways to achieve a low mean arterial pressure, either a decrease in the cardiac output or systemic vascular resistance. Septic shock falls into the broad category of distributive shock and is characterized by a decrease in the systemic vascular resistance and often a compensatory increase in the cardiac output. Why does the decrease in SVR occur? The answer, excessive and uncontrolled release of nitric oxide via an inducible nitric oxide synthase. Excess nitric oxide causes systemic vasodilation and decreases vascular tone. For this reason, patients with septic shock were often warm and flushed. There is also mitochondrial damage, which impairs cellular oxygen utilization in the peripheral tissues and vital organs. What are the end organ effects of pathologic vasodilation and cellular hypoxia? On the screen is a figure used in the shock session. We will again use this figure to discuss clinical effects and end organ dysfunction in septic shock in a head to toe fashion. In the brain, septic shock causes encephalopathy and delirium, in part due to decreased cerebral perfusion. Referring back to earlier in the session, remember that altered mental status is also one of the Q-SOFA criteria. From a respiratory standpoint, septic shock can cause the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. ARDS is one of the most important end organ effects of septic shock and is associated with a significant amount of morbidity and mortality if present. Pictured in this x-ray are the characteristic bilateral alveolar infiltrates of ARDS. Within the cardiovascular system, septic shock can cause ventricular dysfunction. There are multiple GI effects of septic shock, including bowel ischemia due to hypoperfusion, ileus, shock liver, and cholestasis in a calculus cholecystitis. Approximately 50% of patients with septic shock will develop acute kidney injury secondary to acute tubular necrosis, or ATN. Patients may also develop relative adrenal insufficiency, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and thrombocytopenia. At this point, we've discussed definitions of sepsis and septic shock, clinical manifestations, and end organ damage that can result. Next, how do we treat septic shock in order to minimize the chance of all of these horrible things happening? We stated at the beginning of the session that septic shock is a medical emergency requiring immediate treatment. There are four main principles in the management of septic shock. Early antibiotics, fluid resuscitation, vasopressors, and source control. Let's go through each of these principles one by one. First, antibiotics, the life-saving intervention in sepsis and septic shock. From a study in 2014, for every one hour delay in antibiotics and septic shock, there is a 3-7% to increase in the odds of in-hospital death. What is an appropriate initial antibiotic regimen? The initial regimen should include broad gram-negative coverage plus pseudomonas, as well as methicillin-resistant staph aureus, or MRSA coverage. For gram-negative coverage, possible options include piperacillin tazobactam, cefepime plus metronidazole, and meropenem. Metronidazole is included with cefepime for improved anaerobic coverage. For MRSA coverage, possible options include vancomycin and linazolid. Antibiotics need time to work. Therefore, we need to support the patient's blood pressure and perfuse the vital organs while the antibiotics kick in. We accomplish this with fluid resuscitation and vasopressors. First, fluid resuscitation. Patients with sepsis or septic shock should receive a bolus of 30 cc per kilogram of intravenous fluid for initial volume resuscitation. Note, fluid resuscitation in sepsis and septic shock is currently under further investigation with numerous ongoing RCTs. At this time, guidelines continue to recommend an initial 30 cc per kilogram bolus within the first three hours of management. This guideline is from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Report of 2016 and is a strong recommendation with low quality evidence. So, we've decided to give our patient 30 cc per kilogram of IV fluid. Should the patient receive crystalloid, meaning lactated ringers and normal saline, or colloid, meaning albumin or starches? The answer, crystalloid. A Cochrane review from 2018 found no difference in outcomes, including mortality and need for renal replacement therapy, between crystalloid and colloid, with crystalloids being cheaper and more readily available. So, we decided to give our patient a 30 cc per kilogram bolus of crystalloid. For our crystalloid, should we choose lactated ringers or normal saline? The answer, lactated ringers. The SMART Med trial from Vanderbilt in 2018 enrolled more than 15,000 patients and compared LR to NS for initial volume resuscitation in critically ill adults admitted to the ICU. The study found that LR reduced death from any cause, need for new renal replacement therapy, or persistent renal dysfunction. Therefore, LR should be the choice in almost all situations for initial volume resuscitation in critically ill adults.
Finally, it is important to keep in mind that each patient is different, and some patients may require additional fluid after the initial 30 cc per kilogram bolus. Fluid administration at that time should be based upon objective measures of fluid responsiveness, including passive straight leg raise, bedside ultrasound, etc. So, we've administered broad spectrum antibiotics and the patient has received their initial 30 cc per kilogram bolus of lactated ringers. However, as in our example from the beginning of the session, the patient remains hypotensive with an elevated lactate. What do we do next? The answer, add vasopressors. Our goal with vasopressors is to maintain a mean arterial pressure greater than or equal to 65 millimeters of mercury in order to maintain perfusion to the vital organs. The main vasopressors available in the ICU are norepinephrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine, and vasopressin. Of these, which vasopressor do we reach for first? Typically, our first vasopressor is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a predominant alpha-1 agonist with some additional beta agonism. Why norepinephrine? SOAP2 was a large RCT in 2010 that compared norepinephrine to dopamine for treatment of septic shock. The study found no difference in 28-day mortality, but an increased risk of arrhythmias with dopamine compared to norepinephrine. Therefore, norepinephrine became the first presser of choice. So, we add norepinephrine, but unfortunately the patient's mean arterial pressure remains less than 65 on increasing doses of norepinephrine. What presser do we typically add next? The answer, vasopressin. Vasopressin unsurprisingly acts on the vasopressin receptors. Vasopressin is given at a fixed dose of 0.03 or 0.04 units per minute because doses greater than 0.04 increase the risk of coronary and mesenteric ischemia. Why add vasopressin to norepinephrine? The VAST trial in 2008 compared adding additional norepinephrine to vasopressin for patients with septic shock who were already receiving norepinephrine. While the study found no mortality benefit from vasopressin, vasopressin use did allow for decreased dosages of norepinephrine. Therefore, for patients with norepinephrine refractory shock, vasopressin is an appropriate second agent to add. Unfortunately, after adding vasopressin, the patient remains hypotensive with a MAP less than 65. While trying to figure out why the patient is deteriorating, we can add phenylephrine and or epinephrine for blood pressure support. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha-1 agonist. It is typically the third vasopressor added after norepinephrine and vasopressin, but can also be used as a primary vasopressor for patients that develop tachyarrhythmias like AFib with RVR or SVT from the beta agonism of norepinephrine. Epinephrine works via the alpha-1 and beta receptors. Note, it has more beta agonism than norepinephrine. It is typically the third or fourth vasopressor added. If needed, take a second again to review the receptors on which the various vasopressors act. As antibiotics, fluids, and vasopressors are infusing, it's important to go looking for the source of infection with broad cultures and imaging if possible. What about corticosteroids, for example hydrocortisone, in the treatment of septic shock? Corticosteroids are typically reserved for patients in vasopressor refractory shock. Vasopressor refractory shock is typically defined as shock requiring both norepinephrine and vasopressin to maintain a MAP greater than 65. If a patient is requiring both norepinephrine and vasopressin, we can add on hydrocortisone at a dose of either 50 mg every 6 hours or 100 mg every 8 hours. As discussed earlier, patients in septic shock may have relative adrenal insufficiency and corticosteroids may improve vasopressor responsiveness. There have been numerous landmark studies over the last two decades evaluating the role of corticosteroids in septic shock. To name a few, there has been the French trial, otherwise known as the Anon trial, in 2002, Corticus in 2008, and Adrenal and Approaches in 2018. These studies have demonstrated mixed mortality outcomes. The French trial and Approaches both demonstrate a mortality benefit from corticosteroids, while Corticus and Adrenal do not demonstrate a mortality benefit. However, all of these landmark studies demonstrate that corticosteroids are associated with faster resolution of shock, more ventilator-free days, and decreased ICU length of stay, all of which are objectively good things. But what about corticosteroids for patients with sepsis without shock? The HIPRESS trial in 2016 found no role for hydrocortisone in patients with sepsis without shock. In summary, corticosteroids represent an evidence-based salvage therapy for patients with vasopressor refractory septic shock. We've discussed the importance of early antibiotics, IV fluid resuscitation, vasopressors, corticosteroids, and source control. You know these interventions are working by continuously assessing the patient's exam, including mentation, perfusion status, urine output, etc., their vasopressor requirements, and by trending labs every four to six hours. On this page is a checklist highlighting the high yield management principles just discussed. In summary, in this session we define sepsis and septic shock according to the sepsis three definitions, 
We describe the pathophysiologic abnormalities and clinical manifestations of septic shock. And finally, describe the treatment principles for a patient in septic shock, including early broad-spectrum antibiotics, fluid resuscitation with lactator ringers, and vasopressors. Thank you for your participation.